<laughs> my name is Paula Davidson. I'm the library director, and it's nice to see so many people here <coughs> to learn about bees and beekeeping in Vermont. Um, we have had Bill Mary's book here at the library, um, but somehow it got lost, so I'm excited to get it back again. <laughs> um, and I see some of you came with your own copies, <laughs> so we have some fans here. <laughs> oh, we're very happy to present this program, and I'd like to thank uh, Beth Meacham, who's a library trustee, and uh, set this up through the Vermont Humanities Council. I believe it is called Vermont Humanities now. Um, and also coordinated with Bar Hill Spirits to bring in Sophia Barslow, who will be talking after Bill's talk. Um, so this is Bill Mayers, um, and this, again, I, is a Vermont Humanities program. The Vermont Humanities sponsors book discussion programs, literacy programs, and lots of humanities events statewide. And they've done many, many virtual events in the past couple of years that are now recorded. So if you ever have some time and are curious to learn about interesting things, if you look at the Vermont Humanities website, you'll see um, re recordings of a lot of the past lectures. Um, so I'd like to thank them, thank Bar Hill Spirits for helping us sponsor this event and bringing all the spirits for tasting. <laughs> and thank Jasper Hill for providing cheese to go along with the spirits. Uh, also, thanks to HCTV, uh, Harbor Community Television, who is recording this event, so that you can share it with other people. We'll share a link uh, on our Facebook page and over Front Porch Forum. Um, it will also be available on cable channel 1080 in Harbor, Blueberry, and Greensboro Bend, and on the HCTV website. Uh, so thank you all for coming, and we'll let Bill get started. Thank you. Great. Well, thank you all for coming. Uh, my name is Bill Mayers. I've, I've kept bees for about 50 years, I'm, so I'm a pretty good amateur. Um, and, um, but I think that connotes more love of bees than expertise. Um, I'm going to try to do this all in 30 minutes or 35 minutes, so I'm going to talk pretty fast. And, and if you can hold your questions till the end, um, that'd be great. Um, so here's a first a quote from uh, Jonathan Swift. We have rather chosen to fill our hives with honey and wax, thus furnishing mankind with two noblest of things, which are sweetness and light. And Mahatma Gandhi, all we need is to be industrious, not like a machine, but like the honeybee. Now there are 20,000 species of bees worldwide. However, of that number, only about 400 are social. That is, they live together in colonies. The rest are solitary. Only four species produce enough honey to satisfy man's sweet tooth. Three of these species are native to Asia. The eastern honeybee, or Apis serrana, the giant honeybee, or Apis dorsata, and the dwarf bee, or Apis florea. The most prolific, prominent, and widespread bee species is the western honeybee, Apis mellifera. They have been carried to most of the globe because most of their because of their productivity and adaptability, the European bees are now raised in most parts of the world except Southeast Asia and the Arctic regions. They are the primary honey bees in the United States and the focus of this talk. Over 50 million years ago, bees split off from the wasp suborder and switched from animal to plant protein. Bees and flowers co-evolved since flowering plants needed mobile pollinators to procreate and bees needed the protein. The first age, the first history, we try to break the beekeeping history into four rough ages of differing uh, lengths. And the first age is that of honey gathering, it covers those dim eons of time after man first tasted honey and bee stings first lanced human flesh. Neolithic humans, <clears throat> by the way, this is me cutting down a wild swarm in Burlington. Uh, and take note of the, uh, the, the black between the yellow, okay? Those are bees, and there's a reason why those are separated that way. Okay, these are, you can, uh, I'm going to go on and read this, but these are interesting facts that you can read for yourself. You can read faster than I can talk. You can take them away and impress your friends. 
So the first age is the Neolithic period uh, when humans discovered that keen eyesight, patient tracking, and brave climbing gained for the clan not just sweet, sweet savor and energy, but added nutrients from the bee brood or the eggs themselves. And I'll just show you. Um, <clears throat> they also learned that smoke, not fire, was the divine tool for those who would calm the bees and take their honey. We'll never know, of course, but it's fun to imagine innumerable scenes in forests, swamps, deserts, and steppes where aboriginal peoples first dipped their fingers into the hexagonal combs and withdrew the golden sweetness of honey. Did they sit down and eat the bees, comb, brood, honey, and all? Who first hit upon the idea of capturing bees and then releasing them one by one to launch a beeline to their home hive? Who first failed to clean a container of honey only to come back in a few weeks and find that rainwater had transformed the dregs into intoxicating mead? Some of the direct evidence of human, uh, human search for honey comes from cave paintings in Spain, <clears throat> up on the upper left. This one scene from Baraco Fondo in Castellon in eastern Spain shows <clears throat> a man climbing a rope ladder towards a bee nest, and around them fly bees large as dogs. And in Egypt, which was really the first, kind of the first of the second age of bees where beekeepers began, or people began to keep bees instead of being in this stasis with bees in the wild. And so starting probably 4,000 years ago, the Egyptians would make pottery hives and put them on ships, boats, and float up and down the Nile to capture different floral sources with the seasons. <clears throat> this is just a wonderful outlayer. This is a, a, a Cretan uh, gold pendant, obviously using the bee as the um, image. <clears throat> So beekeeping historian Eva Crane notes that the change from hunting of nests of bees with stored honey to keeping bees in their own hives probably took place independently in many parts of the globe. It could well have been occasioned by a swarm <clears throat> settling in an empty basket or tub left upside down, or a pot lying on its side, or a hollow log with bees inside could have been carried home to what was later called an apiary. This cannot be called domestication because the bee's natural healthy instinct was to grow, divide, and swarm. And that's both the, uh, the bane of beekeepers today is swarming. This is a sign of health, not of pathology. But if, you, if the bees swarm, particularly in Vermont, you're not going to get a crop. So there's all kinds of efforts, and uh, most of, many of them failed to pre prevent swarms. Um, <clears throat> because bees attach their comb to the walls of, walls of the hive, the constant engineering problem was how to remove the honey without either killing the bees or destroying the hive's integrity. Now here's a picture from probably the 18th century of <laughs> beekeepers uh, collecting wild uh, swarms to recover them and then uh, variously protected from them with veils or not, or smoke. And um, <clears throat> probably starting in the 14th century, at least in Europe, the skep was uh, a broadly um, uh, adopted as a hive, both portable and, um, and expandable. Um, In the forests of northern and eastern Europe, honey hunting and then beekeeping took a different turn from that around uh, the Mediterranean. As beekeeping historian Eva Crane wrote, human hive building in northern Europe followed a progressive evolutionary pattern of suspended hollow logs to collect swarms and finally logs, usually vertically, in, clean, cl in a clearing or a forest floor or near to the beekeeper's dwelling. Since there was substantial danger from bears and other predators, by the way, if you live in Vermont and want to keep bees and you don't live in Burlington or Rutland, you've got to have a bear fence. Uh, 
it's, it's just <laughs> the Beekeeper's Association almost puts it on its site and says, this is what you should do. So it's all an extra expense for beekeeping, but otherwise the, be the bears are going to take your honey. <clears throat> In Central Europe, uh, beekeeping got a, a big um, boost from the spread of Christianity because the church is need for candles. Every abbey and monastery had its own apiary, and many of the peasants who worked or rented church land also kept bees, and so could pay part of their yearly rent in wax. An improvement on logs, <clears throat> northern Europeans moved to making these skeps. The use of these inverted wooden baskets became so widespread that it has continued to be one of the most common symbols of beekeeping. The baskets were easy to make, they were transportable, and they could be extended to accommodate the increased production of a, of a honey flow. However, straw was not immune to the weather, and there were also evolved protective, but there also evolved protective niches in stone walls called bee bowls, and then distinctive structures to house the bees. <clears throat> This is the inside, so basically the, the bees would build comb on those cross members and then the honey would, the, the comb would hang down, the bees would fill them up, cap them over, and then the beekeeper would kill the bees, usually with sulfur smoke, uh, and uh, take the honey. By the early 17th, so keep that thought, okay, so by the early 17th century, a Spaniard, Luis Mendez de Torres, and then an Englishman, Charles Butler, concluded that the head of the hive was a female. Honeybees were brought first to North America in the early 17th century to the Jamestown colony and then to Plymouth. And through their fecundity and instinct swarm, the white man's fly, as Native Americans termed them, preceded the gradual and ubiquitous European settlement of the continent. For the next two and a half centuries, gifted amateurs across Europe and even in the, in the colonies struggled to gain more control over bees' activities. They charted the working relationship between workers, drones, and the queen. For Charles Darwin, the bees posed an intellectual dilemma as he developed his theory of evolution. How could infertile workers successfully reproduce and flourish? And Darwin's elegant answer was that natural selection may be applied to the family as well as to the individual and may thus gain the desired end. So throughout this period, really up until the middle of the 19th century, the central challenge for beekeepers was to remove the honey without killing the bees. This lasting drawback of the skeps was that you had to kill the bees in order to get the honey. Um, so it remained for uh, Lorenzo Langstroth. This is just a, a artful picture of beekeeping in the probably the early 19th century or late, probably the early 19th century. Um, <clears throat> but it remained for uh, a, a Yale trained congregational minister named Lorenzo Langstroth to split the atom of beekeeping in 1851. Langstroth had taken up beekeeping as a young man, and he read widely in the already considerable literature of beekeeping. He became intrigued with the spacing between the, between the frame, between the combs. And if we go back to... <clears throat> and he came up with a counterintuitive idea of giving bees more room in which to work. And in his 1851 diary, he recorded a eureka moment, this almost self-evident idea of using the same bee space, as his term, as in the shallow chambers came into mind. And this bee space, which Langstroth discovered, was the roughly three-eighths of an inch you see before you between the frames which allow the bees to create <clears throat> the space in which they can crawl and work easily between the combs. So in effect, they create their own hallway so they don't bump into each other. Or like a good bar, behind a good bar, you see people who really work together, but they're not bumping into each other. <clears throat> so if the space in the hallways is any narrower, he discovered, the bees would fill it with gluey propolis. 
uh, and the protective, the protective substance the bees use to seal cracks. If it were wider, the bees would fill the space with new comb. So Langstroth patented his invention, or his discovery, <clears throat> but it was so widely infringed upon that he never made any money from the invention. But within a decade of Langstroth's discovery or invention, depending upon your perspective, began the third age of beekeeping. That is beekeeping for profit. So that manufactured um, hives like this, you could produce um, significant amounts of honey and move it into the market, local markets, national markets, international markets. So by 10 years later, uh, Langstroth hives were being used in South America, in Europe, um, not quite in Asia because they were still had those other their own their own bees, but the simplicity and, and design <clears throat> a lot swept the country. And then there were several other advances that rounded out what is even still the beekeeping industry of today. The first was a mechanical extractor, it was invented by a Czech. Um, although he lived in the Austro-Hungarian Empire, um, named Ruska. It was basically like a washing machine. So you cut the tops off the frames, put them in there, and spin them by hand. And that gradually over the years got more and more um, elaborate. So you can now buy 72 frame extractors or 100 frame um, extractors. But that allowed the beekeeper to extract and then run the honey through a filter a lot easier than doing it by hand. Uh, second invention, uh, or third invention, was a smoker. And uh, the important things about the smokers was <coughs> that bees communicate uh, to a large extent by smell, by pheromones, inside a dark hive. And what the smoke did was allow the beekeeper to uh, suppress the alarm pheromone, the alarm smell that bees emit when they're threatened in some way. And so any beekeeper, well, any, if you're around beekeepers and they don't use smoke, avoid them. I mean, it's, it's just stupid. It's a, it's a stupid macho trick. And um, so this, you know, simple uh, <clears throat> smoker by this guy somewhere in, in the middle of New York. And then it became, of course, used all around the around the world. <clears throat> um, then also a, a hive tool and then people said, well, yeah, we've got to manufacture veils because even so, if you're going to be working with bees, you don't want to get stung in the eye. So accompanying this clutch of mechanical advances was a desire to improve the bees' genetic stock. Beekeepers now saw the economic weakness of the original German black bee, which was brought here in the 17th century which was more susceptible to disease and also more aggressive or defensive, depending upon how your, your perspective. So Americans went in search of better bees and found them in Western and Eastern Europe. The first import was the Italian bee, Apis mellifera ligustica, probably still the most popular bee race of bees, calm, gentle, pro productive, and slow to swarm. However, they were susceptible to some of the diseases and, and um, pests, pests of today. So then people went to what is now Slovenia to, uh, to uh, get uh, carniolans. Uh, carniola is another, you know, Italian, I think it's Latin name for that area. Um, and they have been brought back and used in um, hybrid form. And um, in the 20th century, there, there have been bees brought from um, a Catholic abbey in uh, England called Buckfast Abbey. And also from, um, um, well, this is what a modern extractor looks like. Uh, and, um, and then uh, lately, I mean, the most interesting one of imports is some Russian, what are now called Russian queens, which came from Siberia. And uh, they, they were hybridized because they were the, it was from an area which the longest interdigitation between Apis mellifera and Apis serrana, which I'll get come back to in a discussion about Varroa mites. But in any case, so today, just think about what are bees worth to you? 
What are they worth to society? What are they worth to the economy? So the American honey produced in America now might be worth 300, 350 million dollars. The value of bees for pollination is about 25 billion. And uh, these are the principal um, crops that are pollinated by bees for hire. And so for example, um, in January, 80 to 90 percent of all the bees in the United States were in California pollinating almonds. And they got there on semi-trailer trucks. So that's two million hives go to California. Um, and um, so again, you can read these faster than I can. Uh, but uh, just remember this disparity, but also think about how long this model can work of having the these bees put on trucks and go they go to so they go to apples in Michigan, they go to blueberries in Maine, they go to oranges in Florida. But almonds are the big one. And what is California? California is you know, in a permanent drought. Uh, and uh, what are almonds? This is airline finger food. Uh, I mean that's a little cynical, but but it's it's um, but these are the guys that pay, really, they run the industry on which I am dependent as a very small time a beekeeper because they're, they're doing the paying for the, helping to pay for the research, they're paying for the, the infrastructure of this industry. Um, and as if that wasn't enough, um, there's a number of, of um, challenges to beekeeping that have been around, some have been around for over a hundred years, American Fowl Brew being one of them. Um, and another is the uh, arrival of a pest, the pest of the Asian honeybee, Apis serrana, which arrived in the 80s and still is public enemy number one for beekeepers in the United States, really beekeepers in the world. Um, and uh, <clears throat> I don't know if you remember, this is what, 16 years ago, uh, disappearing bees, people talk about CC, what's happening? It made beekeepers the center of everybody's attention because you, you always get people saying, what's happening with the bees? How are your bees doing? So it was great for us. We didn't have any better answer, but at least we got attention from, from people. Um, and I have to, how many, how many do remember CCD? People talking about what's happening to the bees? Okay, well, there is this. I've got this great thing to read to you. I could do. Uh, well, ah, here it is. Okay. So I got this friend. He wrote this to the Washington Post, 2006. And you remember, uh, there were all kinds of theories about uh, what was happening, and one of them was the cell, t cell phone towers. Mm -hmm. They were zapping the bees. Um, navigation system so they they'd fly out and then they would get zapped and they couldn't fly home mm -hmm. so he wrote this letter <clears throat> he says are cell phones killing our bees I never let my bees use cell phones <laughs> they are social insects and I have found that once I let them have cell phones it's impossible to control their use the charges from time overruns can bankrupt even the most efficient apiary operation once they learn to use them they become dependent they stop returning to the hive to dance and just phone in the location of their forage <laughs> discoveries. Furthermore, the increased peer-to-peer peer -peer <clears throat> communication plays havoc with traditional bee values. To hack with pheromones, they say, chemical communication is passe compared to digital. As in many societies, the young are the early adopters spending their time text messaging instead of doing their jobs. To the end, to <clears throat> To, to, in, in the end, they, they, we observe a breakdown in hierarchy and, fatally, anti-royalist sentiment. This, then, is the cause of CCD. Foolish notions of independence among the immature, the loss of authority of the elders, the breakdown in Greek group cohesion, and the collapse of the aristocracy. So. Okay, so... Um, Perfect storm. Think about that. I mean, so it's it's not one thing. 
And there's, there's a lot of discussion and debate, and depending upon your perspective, as to what's the primary cause of the bees' problems today. And um, I'm of the uh, um, school that believes it's a lot of things. I think it is varroa mites primarily. But varroa mites are also bringing viruses uh, into the hive. Uh, they're weakening the bees to be susceptible to other things. But if you look at these, I think you can at least read the large text. And this is a lot of, a lot of pressure on this little creature. And um, they're not going away. Um, and so really, if you look down at sort of beekeeper practices themselves. So when I teach a beekeeping class um, at uh, Seaview High School, uh, and the first thing I ever say to people now is, if you don't want to work at this hobby, go get another hobby. This is too important to bees for you to be half-assed about it, that you, you really have to be learning how to do this. And it's a little preachy, but it's true. When I started, you could just leave the bees in benign neglect, and you only worried about one thing called American fowl brood. And if the bees swarmed, that was a sign of health, and you kept going. But this is stuff that is not just you're under your control. You've got your neighbors to deal with. You've got uh, indiscriminate use of pesticides, insecticides, Roundup. Uh, and, um, but also you've got this mite that no one, we really haven't solved. Um, the beekeepers have become farmers in the sense that we use IPM, integrated pest management, to deal with it. Uh, but it still isn't the silver bullet. And the silver bullet is never going to appear. I don't think. Uh, so you can read this quickly, but this is the, the reddish uh, things are the mites. That's the, that's the real threat. Uh, and, um, and that's what it looks like. And it's hard to read the print here, but what, what's important for you to understand is you've got these different gestation periods for the a queen is the shortest period of time. Why is that? Well, if, a honey, if the hive loses a queen, there's no production of bees until the queen can lay again. So she'll hatch out and the replacements will hatch out in 16 days. The workers are 21 days and the drones are 24. But over here, um, this is, I, you can't, I can't even read this, but, but the, the takeaway here is to think of what happens in the six weeks of a worker bee's life is going through something like six or eight different jobs as it emerges from the cell, works in the hive, then goes out its last two weeks to forage for water, pollen, and nectar, and usually dies in flight because they're carrying half their body weight in these products. Um, and uh, so that's down here. Uh, and um, marvelous creatures they are. All right, let's see. We're almost done. Um, <clears throat> uh, these are just some pictures I've taken. This is China. They're actually feeding sugar water to these hives because they probably were short on nectar. Uh, this was, uh, these were the meanest bees I ever encountered. On a scale of 10, they were 11s. Um, but it was bad beekeeping. It wasn't the bees themselves. These were Africanized or killer bees. But people in you know, Mexico, they know how to work. They're, they're also Africanized bees. But look at how pacific they are. Everybody's cool and laid back. Uh, imagine having 35 or 40 hives on your back porch. It says, Manuel Hirachi and his partner in beekeeping, the donkey Boneco, they keep bees in the savanna of Brazil known as El Cerrado. Um, well, Brazil is important because in 1956 there was a biologist um, who thought he would increase the productivity of, Argent of uh, Brazilian bees. So he went to Africa and brought back some queens and then the story gets hazy. He claims they got out and started uh, causing havoc all around South America and killing animals and people and stuff. He claim, he, uh, that's what he claims, but other people say, well, he really released them and they got away from him. But in any case, that's where they came from. They had been Africanized. So when you, you know, people complain about bees in Arizona and New Mexico and California. 
Uh, those are Africanized. They are bees that overwhelmed the European honeybees uh, traits, and now uh, they're, if not universal, these says they're widespread in the Southwest. But at least poetic justice was done because they got to Hollywood. You remember all those movies about bees, the swarm and killers from, from space? Well, they're now um, Africanized killer bees in Hollywood. So where have we seen this picture before? So these are just you know, a couple slides of how Europeans have used honeybees and Chinese as well. Uh, and a little uh, promo for our book, which we uh, spent three or four years on it. It was really it was fun doing. And um, there are copies here. I'd be happy to sell you one. Um, and uh, just a few great Vermonters. This, this guy's my favorite because he, he was a, a, a saddler. He, he raised um, or he made harness and stuff in Waitsfield just before the Civil War. And he, he volunteered and he fought at Gettysburg. And he was in the, he was in the, the, the against, he fought against uh, Pickett's Charge and the guy on either side of him was killed, but he, he, he survived and came home. And he, uh, someone gave him a book by Quimby, the guy who invented the smoker, and he took up beekeeping. And within four years, he had about 150 hives, and then he eventually had 700 hives. He was the largest beekeeper in Vermont um, until the 90s. And then his wife died. He moved to California to raise potatoes. So <laughs> what does that mean? So look at this. I mean, look at this. It's amazing. For Jens, 1890, there's got to be at least 100 hives there. And uh, look at these people, great. You know, I think they're more, well, probably at least equal number of members. And you see the this same, these same um, cathedral uh, hives, which few people do anymore because they're not practical to have the, that kind of top. But, and I wish I knew what the, the or, origin of this. I just think it's a great example of, of one generation teaching the other beekeeping. Uh, Enid Tompkins was an inspector, uh, taught beekeeping at UVM, and Sister Angie was one of uh, several nuns um, in Burlington who kept bees. They had 20 hives at one point. This is my mentor, a retired geologist in Waterford. Really a great, great amateur, well, more, yeah, it was an amateur beekeeper. He made great comb honey. Uh, former state inspector, just nice picture. Uh, Remember all pollinators. You know, that's, that's my last kind of takeaway. And this guy, Buxman, uh, said once in Soto Voce at a beekeeping conference, I hate honeybees. Uh, but but the, the message is, you know, protect all of them. I mean, we don't want an inter-knee sign battle between the bee, honeybees and others. I mean, the, the tent is all of us. Uh, so I, although my talk's about honeybees, um, just remember the other pollinators. Questions? Uh, yeah? How does the varroa mite get introduced to the hive initially? Well, it came over probably. Uh, but, well, so I have a hive, yeah. and I'm in a rural setting. Yeah. That's just one hive. Yeah. How would a varroa mite get into my hive? Well, it'd come from another hive. You have another, other bees within two miles. So they'll like bump up against each other. Oh, right on their back. They'll piggyback on a. So it's if called, the bees are out on a flower, they're gonna like bump with another bee. Yeah, yeah. So the the mites are either they're they're usually um, um, the female goes and lays eggs inside a usually a drone cell, and then when they come out, they ride around on the backs of other bees. They're called the phoretic mites, and then they if you bump up against another. They they'll they'll come, and they'll look for a look for a place to go, and there are enough of them out there that almost everybody is going to get them. So you can't say, well, just because I'm out in the middle of nowhere, I'm going to be. You're a little safer, but I wouldn't take that to the bank. So how do you treat for That's Come and take our class. Okay. Okay. <laughs> yeah. What's the connection between the bees and the gin? I'm sorry. What's the connection between the bees and the gin? And the, I didn't make this connection. You, uh, that's above my pay grade. We'll uh, get there. Yeah. She's going to talk about that. Yes. 
Do the African bees also produce honey? Yes, they do. Yeah, I've been working with a group to help beekeeping and beekeepers in Central America, and all of the all the bees are Africanized. Uh, but if you do it right, they're they're actually um, they're probably not as as productive because they they tend to swarm a little bit more, but they're they're more aggressive in protecting against mites, and and um, so you know it's a it's a trade off. But they have learned after having their whole industry collapse 30 years ago when the Africanized bees came through, they have now are starting to restore that um, in certain places. And you know the, the way they, I don't know if you can remember the, the, the contrast between the ones in Panama and the other one, this is the way you set the hives up. You only have one, one box um, and you take the honey off quickly and you don't bang them around. And, but yeah, they're, they're, making, they're making honey and selling it both in country and outside. Yeah. Why are they called Africanized bees? Well, because they are bees that were here. They were European honeybees, and they brought. They they. When when this guy brought the bees in the 50s, and they started to come through, they would overwhelm a colony, but and introduce primarily aggressive genes. So, but the, that meant that the local bees were. Africanized by originally by the, the bees brought from Africa, but not wholly. So it, it's really a it's a definitional um, description of of these bees because they're no longer entirely European bees, but they're not Sahelian bees mm -hmm. um, as they would have been originally. So they are Africanized. Does that help? Yeah. 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 How dangerous are they? Yeah. The African bees. Uh, well, the danger comes in the numbers. So if you get stung by one African bee, it's just like being stung by a regular bee. But the crowd, and so the, the, first, <laughs> the first death in the United States was in Hidalgo, Texas, 1990, when uh, they'd come across the Rio Grande and there was a woman who was out on her porch and she heard this buzzing underneath. And she looked down and she saw this bunch of bees, so she gets her, her um, broom, and she goes, ch -ch -ch -ch. you know how you do, so they break it up. Well, she got 500 stings on her way to the hospital, and then. So, um, so it's, it's the numbers. Um, we, in the, that Panama, that, those bees chased us a half a mile in a pickup truck, uh, and uh, they really were mean. Um, but that was the beekeeper, I mean, the, the owner. This was absentee beekeeping. So this guy, guy lived in Panama City, 300 miles away. Well, he's happy to get the honey, but he's meanwhile subjecting his workers to, you know, pretty wretched conditions. Eric. Yeah, what's the state of beekeeping in Vermont? Is it growing, is it stable, declining? Are more people doing it, yeah. successful? I'd say it's, it's, uh, it's probably getting slightly better. I mean, the numbers have, gone up and there's, there's one guy who's uh, moving four or five thousand hives inside, in and out the, of the state depending upon the season. So he'll take bees to California or Florida uh, and the number of beekeepers is, has grown up. Our association has about 500 members and their estimate there may be 800, 900 beekeepers in the state. The, I think the honey production is up. I think the variety, if you go into stores, I mean, there are more people selling local honey. It's not, uh, you know, I'd say it's, it's better than it, it's in the past. Um, and uh, the, the people who are doing it are more diligent than they were. I think people have been frightened or at least caught more cautious about getting into the hobby because it's, it's not for nothing. I mean, you just do the basic equivalent, that's 600 bucks or so, and then if you can do a bear fence, that's another four or 500. So it's, it's real money. And it, 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 most people say, well, I'm not gonna recover that, but I wanna make sure that I, I protect the bees, and this is, this is the cost of, of um, doing business. So I'd say it's, it's margin, well, slightly better than it was 10 years ago. Yeah. What triggers the swarm? 
Well, two things. One is the the hive gets too crowded, so you could have a first year queen that is um, running out of space to lay eggs. She doesn't want to be going laying eggs in, in honey in nectar, so she starts looking around, and the hive says, "Okay," and she sends out this signal. You know, it's it's time to go, ladies. Well, then they start. Then the hive starts to build swarm cells on the bottoms of the frames, and so the the timing works out where. She leaves with half the bees, and the first of the queens hatches out from those queen cells, of which there have been eight or ten, and the first one out has been listening to the other queens. They pipe, they go pee, 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 pee. So she goes around and stings each of those other cells to kill pretenders, to kill her rivals. So she reigns supreme. Then she will go off and um, mate with up to 20 drones in a wonderful place they call drone congregation areas. It's like a street corner. You know, so she's, you know, she, she's not promiscuous. I mean, what, what, what's really important is that she, she, if, if she only mates with one drone, she's only getting one set of genetic material. But in order to do all these different jobs, she's got to have a mix of stuff. So therefore, Ideally, she's going to mate with somewhere between 10 and 20 drones over a two-day period. But if rain and you know, she can't get out and she misses that period, well, then the hive is, is threatened again because there's no replacement. So there's a lot of tricky biology that we can't control and we beekeepers. But that's ideal and that's, that's what happens. So, yeah. so, so what do you do about it? What do you, do? What do you as a beekeeper do? Well, you hope that uh, we are not going to get a honey crop out of that under the best of circumstances. So you hope that this process will proceed and um, you wait for that queen to go out and get bread and then within seven or eight days she should start laying. Um, but she won't start laying the next day. So you have to just be patient and hope that your other hives are not going to swarm. But you, you've lost the production from that hive, because you only got half the bees left in it after she's left. Now, you might be lucky and go and be able to capture the swarm, put her somewhere else, but you're still not going to get a, a, a crop out of that hive. Yeah? It, uh, do people still uh, provide the service of bringing one or two hives to a farm to provide pollination? Yeah. Yeah, and there's, it's even uh, it's even more um, casual than that, is that, that we have on our website um, a place where you could say, look, I've got a backyard, I've, I've, let's say I, I planted buckwheat, or I've got a flower garden, I'd like to, would you, do you want to put a hive there? And you can take the honey and you can deal with it, or you can have something that has, where money is exchanged. Um, it's more likely, the first is more likely than the second, but people still do it. Website is where? What's the website? Uh, the Vermont Beekeepers Association website. Thank yeah, you. I used to uh, pollinate a guy's apple trees um, in um, South Burlington until he died. and But that just meant I had to take two hives out and put them in his apple orchard and it was fun. Yeah? I'm sorry? Does a bear fence have to be electric? Yep. Yeah, well, I mean, unless it's chain link and, and uh, but, which is a lot more expensive than the electric. Um, and, but almost all of them are electric that I know about. Yeah? What's the lifespan of the queen? Well, it used to be maybe four or five years, if, um, but it's just decreased over the last 30 years. And now I replace my queens every year um, because I, I just think that they're stronger, they're less prone to swarm, and um, I'm trying to get the maximum amount of honey early in the season. Um, other people, it used to be, well, even some, some people will take pride in saying, well, I got a three-year-old queen or a four-year-old queen. Uh, different strokes. What, what was the chart you had up that made it look like the queen lived 20 days? Oh. 
the life of the honeybee family. Yeah. No, this just means this is gestation period. So from the time, we're, let's just say that, that somehow you lost the queen or has been a swarm. Well, the swarm's a little more. Let's say you mistakenly, you screwed up, and you were pulling the hives out, pulling frames out, and you killed the queen. But you knew it, okay? So immediately, her smell is gone, okay? So now the, the, the hive says, we've got to have, the most important thing we gotta do is, is start a new queen. So they will move uh, cells, move eggs, less likely, or they'll take cells that have, say, six, six hour old or eight hour old eggs in them, and they'll immediately start making, uh, uh, filling them up with royal jelly. All bees get royal jelly for three days, the queen gets royal jelly for nine days. Then they cap her over, cap over probably eight or ten or fifteen. Then, after sixteen days, that first one uh, hatches out, and then she goes around to sting the other queen cells because they always will they'll do multiple <coughs> queen uh, cells. Is that clear? Yeah, and, and the others live uh, ten, tens of days. Yeah, well, not live. They're, no, it's the gestation. It's the time in the cell. But on the other side, you have end of life. 30. Oh, well, this is the workers. This is what the workers would do in, in, uh, in um, what, six weeks, seven weeks. Uh, and, and these are the jobs that they hold before they die. Okay. Yeah. And that, that's just for the summer, the winter, they're longer? Oh, no, they're, they're gone. In the, in the winter, there isn't quite that much to do. So, so they have a longer lifetime? They have a longer lifetime. They're not doing very much. So uh, bees can live in the middle of the winter. They might, the workers might live three or four months, but as soon as there's activity, as soon as they're moving around, they will start dying. And the, the queen, so what happens to the, the curve on the number of bees, so you can have 50,000, 60,000 bees in a strong colony in the summer, that would decline to maybe 20,000 in the middle of the winter. And then in March, the queen starts to lay again. And, and so she's gonna lay 1,000 eggs or 1,200, 1,500 eggs a day. Uh, yeah? So the you said the queen stings the other potential rival queen. Yep. Yep. I always thought a bee can only sting once and then it dies. Queen, queen, queen doesn't have barbs on her, okay. on her stinger. She's the only one. So it's a rapier and it just goes in and kills okay. them. And, and then is the maiden flight for the queen just once in her lifetime or is it once at the start of the season? No, it's many times. It's, I mean, it's, it's 15 or 20 times ideally. Okay. But she goes out to the street corner, yeah. this drone congregation area several times, several days. So she'll go out and fly through it and, uh, and she mates in flight. The male dies and then she'll keep going, come back, go back. She spends a lot of time on the street corner. Is that enough eggs for five Pardon? years? What? And she can lay enough eggs for like the next five years? Oh, yeah, she'll, get enough, uh, she'll get enough sperm for eight million eggs. That's amazing. I know. A lot of amazing things about bees. Okay. One more. How do you introduce a, a new queen? Okay. Uh, like you did it every year. Well, you, you, you buy them in cages. They come in a little box, and uh, it's got screen on top. It's got a shorter plug at one end, and then at the other end it's open, or it's got a, it's got a cork plug. And then you introduce that into a hive and um, you hope and expect that the bees inside will gradually eat away the candy plug over three or four days. And they'll eat some of it because there's some extra bees inside and they'll, they'll eat from both ends of the tunnel. And then after three or four days, the queen's smell, scent, will have permeated the hive and they'll say she's a friendly. And so when she emerges, they don't, immediately, what wonderful word, they won't ball the queen, which means they would all grab, they'd suffocate her, they'd, they'd grab and, and surround her. Um, and then there's a couple other techniques, but that's, that's been the, the same um, for 100 years, 150 years. Okay, thank you.
resident. I also am keeping bees for the first time this spring, and I've um, and the Vermont sales manager for Bar Hill. Uh, going on my 11th year, we got our distillery started in Caledonia. Yeah, Caledonia Spirits is our distillery that we started in Hardway. We were founded by a beekeeper, Todd Hardy, who also lives here in Greensboro, and um, stored Thornhill Farm. And we were founded by a distiller, Ryan Christensen. So. Todd I describe as the Lorax, except he speaks for the bees, and he instilled within the culture of Caledonia spirits um, inve he, investment and uh, connection with our people, our place, our process, and our pollinators. So we do a lot with raw honey, working with raw honey. We distill it. We, well, we, first we make a mead and then distill that mead into vodka. So our, our Bar Hill vodka is distilled entirely from raw honey. No potato, no grain. Mm -hmm. Our gin is finished with raw honey, which delivers countless botanicals to our spirits. It's the number one selling gin in Vermont, and it's the most awarded gin that's domestically distilled in the United States. Mm -hmm. And then our Tomcat gin is the classic gin, same distillate, except it then rests in oak barrels for six to nine months, and it emerges with a beautiful color, and it's, a, it's where gin meets bourbon. So there's two things that, there's many things that we do to support pollinators and beekeepers, but some of the two initiatives that I'll talk about today briefly are Bees Knees Week. And Bees Knees Week we started in 2017, and it's now become the largest sustainability event in the entire spirits industry. And what Bees Knees Week is, is it's a celebration of honeybees and how important they are to our food systems by drinking a Bees Knees cocktail. The Bees Knees cocktail was invented in 1929 in Paris. And it's three simple ingredients. It's gin, raw honey, and lemon juice. And so we feel that Bar Hill Gin is the best gin for a Bees Knees cocktail. Um, so every year at the end of September, we promote the Bees Knees cocktail with consumers and also with bars where the cocktail is either made at home or served at a bar. And then a picture is taken of the cocktail, posted to social media, and for every cocktail posted during Bees Knees Week, Bar Hill plants 10 square feet of pollinator habitat. So last year we planted, we raised enough posts to plant four um, acres of pollinator habitat. And this year we work with Be the Change. It's a nonprofit in Weybridge, Vermont, which is neighbors Middlebury. And so they're the pollinator experts. And this year we were able to plant some pollinator habitat at the Highland Center for the Arts. So a group of Caledonia Spirits employees came out, worked with Patrick from Be the Change, and. You might notice on the gallery, outdoor gallery walk a nice um, line of buckwheat and mustard seed and mm -hmm. sunflowers. So the Be the Change, their mission is to plant pollinator habitat in every state in, or every town in Vermont. So that's one way we support pollinators um, by planting, by drinking Bees Knees cocktail to plant pollinator habitat. And then this year we started an initiative called the Vermont Bee Scholarship where we sponsor um, beekeepers to go to farmers markets. So we pay their membership dues so that they can have a pathway into farmers markets. Um, and so we're actually sponsoring the, the um, Vermont Beekeeping Association president, Farmer James, which you might know him, James Key, who's in Bethel. And he's starting to research a queen um, breeding program. He and I were just uh, representing the beekeepers Association at the Vermont Fresh Network Forum oh, cool. on I was Sunday. There. Were you there? Yeah. Why'd you stop and see us? <laughs> Come on. Gin. Oh, how, could you, <laughs> how could you not? You know, James' voice booms as you. He came over. Oh, he did. Okay, yeah. all right. Um, so that's the that's the short and sweet of it. Any questions? Yeah. I just want you to know that at a bar called a restaurant called Bar Six in the West Village in New York City, they serve the Bar Hill Gin cocktail. Uh, Excellent. Yeah. <laughs> nice. Go one better than that. I went to a gin distillers in London, and he had it on the shelf. And I said, "Oh, it's from Vermont." And he said, "That is the holy grail of gin that yes. we all aim for." Oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, really? Oh, yeah. And it's because we are real people in a real place making a real pol product, and we care about pollinators. It's and all about the And you can taste the difference. Yes, you can taste the difference, and it's the raw honey. I mean. It delivers countless botanicals. It's so important to have raw honey versus pasteurized honey. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. And our namesake, of course, is the Bar Hill Nature Preserve right off the road. Todd, who has his um, 
roots in Scotland, he decided to name the distillery Caledonia Spirits because Caledonia County is where Hardwick is, but Caledonia is also another name for Scotland. And then he decided to name the spirits, which are all honey inspired because they all contain raw honey, after Bar Hill because he describes Bar Hill as a thin place, which is a Scottish term for as close to heaven as you're going to get while still standing and breathing on this earth. <laughs> <laughs> so that, that little landscape drawing is, there's Caspian Lake right in the middle of the little landscape drawing. All right, any other right. questions or stories? <laughs> Yeah. Well, I have a story of a son who lives in San Francisco and he's crazy about Bar Hill Gin. So there's one thing on his Christmas wish list was a t-shirt. Okay. <laughs> so I had to get one and send it to him. Now he wants one of those placards that you see in bars. Oh yeah. If you sell them. Like a barrel head? Uh, there, there's something that they hang up in bars that he wants. Yes, I think it's the barrel head. I have a little one right here. Yeah. Cool. You sell those? We we I believe we do sell the barrel heads at the distillery. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Should we have some cheese and? Yeah. yeah. And I've got I've got some I've got some books if anybody wants to buy one. <laughs>